Great stuff. Open your Bibles then, Acts chapter 10. Let me start with these words, see if you know them. It's a world full of laughter, a world of tears, a world of hopes and a world of fears. There's so much that we share that it's time we're aware it's a small world after all. It's a small, small world. Do you know where that comes from? Anybody? Well, it's the Disney song. It's the Disney song that you hear as you go into the small world tunnel ride in Disneyland theme parks in California, Florida, Tokyo, Paris, Hong Kong. For 50 years now, you've heard that song if you've gone on one of those rides, and you go on a little boat uh, in the tunnel in this sort of maze of moving plastic, uh, moving uh, animatronic people and animals as they nod to you as you go past, and this sort of three minutes of fantasy land coming to an end, and the great irony is that many millions of people have gone on this ride, and they've all got to the end of the ride, got off the boat, and not connected with anybody else other than the person they sat in the boat with. It's a small, small world. It's a weird ride, and yeah, I think in some ways it's a window on our age. It tells us something about the kind of world in which we live today. Uh, many of us have been uh, connected with our mobile phones today. We've probably come into the church with our mobile phone. We could reach the whole world this evening with a message. And for all I know, somebody's tweeting right now, it's a small world, or Googling, it's a small world. And you're sending it out there, and there's millions of your followers on Twitter thinking, what is he on about? And there's, you know, there's all sorts of stuff going on. And in many ways, we can be attached with anybody, anywhere, at any time. But at the same time, we're very aware, aren't we, that we are very isolated as people in this generation. I mean, you can have millions, well, hundreds and thousands of friends on Facebook, but not actually connect with many of them at all. In, in this world, I reckon that actually we don't really physically connect or relationally connect with as many people as we used to because people are so isolated with technology. We're not actually connecting with people, we just think we are. Now, there was this article in The Telegraph recently that talked about Britain being the loneliest place in Europe, the, loneliest, the loneliness capital of Europe. And there's a follow-up article by a lady called Radhika Sangani. She says, loneliness is often associated with older people, but the new data suggests 18 to 24-year-olds are the loneliest generation of all. Remembering her student days, she goes back and she says, that was true for me. The prospect of great nights meeting many people, but the reality was one of short-lived, superficial friendships that never lasted. She quotes, now let me quote what she says. She says, quickly changing social circles crashed all around me. This was bad. From the look on Facebook, everyone else was fulfilling the promise of having a time of their lives. They'd found their perfect set of friends. Well, I was struggling to figure out who I actually was and who I actually wanted to spend time with. And I reckon that's how a lot of us feel in this generation. Uh, for all our loneliness, the great irony actually is that we pick our own friends still. We choose people on our own grounds. Uh, if you watch the same TV as me, and if you listen to the same music as me, and if you want to come to the same film as me, then I'll be your friend. Uh, I choose where I go, who I meet, what I listen to, and the kind of music I'm interested in. And if you fit my criteria, you can be my friend. You choose your friends on Facebook, don't you? What criteria do you choose them by? You see, I reckon we do live in a small world today. Despite all our technology, we're very short-sighted, I think, as people. We're defined by our own boundaries and barricaded by our own preferences. We decide what goes on in our little lives. And the big sadness is that actually we do that in the church as well. And that's what this passage is all about. That's why Acts chapter 10 this evening, is so spot on and relevant to us as a church because it's about how we connect with our small world with God's big heart because God's big heart is so massively compassionate on this world this evening. So much bigger is his heart than our hearts for this world this evening without him. And so he wants to show us the big picture. And that's what he does with Peter, isn't it? He shows Peter, God's big heart for a whole world of people who aren't living with Jesus as their saviour. A whole world which is crying out for Christ. A whole world which is ready to hear the gospel, but nobody wants to go. 
nobody wants to connect with. Thank God this evening, his world and his heart is much bigger than ours. <laughs> he loves this world with a great compassion. And Acts, actually, the whole story of Acts is about how the church didn't really hear the message that they were to be an outward-bound church. That's the progression of the book, that God is getting them, if I can say it, he's kind of giving them a divine kick up the backside to say, look, there's a whole world out there yet to hear about the resurrection of Jesus Christ. The story of Acts is about building on the firm foundation of the empty tomb of Christ's resurrection, his ascension, and the staggering outpouring of his spirit. And the church has everything it needs to go out with great certainty and excitement and expectancy. But rather than being expectant, they are inward looking. And that's a great tragedy. That's the same today, you know. The church has everything it needs to reach a lost world as the finished gospel work of the Lord Jesus Christ. Which means whoever you are this evening, whatever background you come from, whichever nation you come from, whatever your past mess in life, there's a saviour for you this evening for all people. And he will forgive you. And he will provide for you a home in heaven amongst all those people who trust him for salvation. And that's our message, but we don't. We don't see the prospect of taking that out to a lost world. And so as we arrive with Peter, actually he and the church are still in a ghetto attitude. They have a ghetto mentality. That means they're more characterized by introspection than expectation. They look inwardly in the church. If you go back to chapter 9 and 32, if you've got a Bible, we see there that Peter is in the context where he's got great freedom. The persecution stopped because Paul, the great persecutor, has been saved. He's been changed by Jesus Christ. And yet we, we read in 932 that Peter travelled about the country. Where did he go? He went to visit the saints in Lydda. He's doing great things for God. The healing of Aeneas, the raising of Dorcas. He's doing it all, but in very safe territory. He's doing great things for Christ, but there are many people who don't know about it because he's just playing it safe. And maybe you and me are a bit like that with Christianity sometimes, aren't we? We're doing all sorts of good things, we think. But we're playing it safe. We don't really go out of our comfort zone. And Peter hadn't stepped a millimetre out of his. He was in a Hebrew subculture, an inward-looking Hebrew subculture, because that's what the church was. Gentile converts were very few, one or two, like the Ethiopian eunuch. But six years after the resurrection... The church still hadn't got going. Hebrew apostles leading the church in Hebrew ways. Was it growing? Yes, but only amongst Hebrews, amongst its own kind. And something drastic had to happen from God to get these people going. Otherwise, they'd just end up a small sect of religion. And Acts 10 is this pivotal moment where God puts his gracious hand on the church and says, get going. Get rid of this ghetto mentality. I want to turn your heart of stone into a heart of flesh, which beats with my heart for a lost world without Jesus Christ. For you to go to the unreached people groups and see what they're like without Christ and tell them about salvation in Jesus Christ. And Peter personifies this ghetto mentality. But there's a second great danger that he and us have with the gospel, and that's that we have a dangerously cold heart. That because we know about Jesus Christ, we forget about everybody else who doesn't. Now, Peter was written into the Bible in very many ways to remember what a cold heart looks like. It's a sobering thing to remember. Do you remember when Jesus went to the cross and Peter associated with the Roman soldiers? And John says in 1818... It was cold, and the servants and officials stood around the fire they had made to keep warm. Peter was also with them, warming himself. Now, that's more than just a temperature gauge thing. That's a graphical impression of what it's like to deny Jesus. There's symbolism there, which says, actually, many of us live as chameleon Christians. We just adopt what everybody else is doing. And in doing that, we actually become no use to anybody else at all because we just synchronize with the world that we're in. And we lose the dynamic message of being different for Jesus Christ. 
And John says that was cold of Peter because just a few hundred meters away there was one who was going to be lifted up and all men would come to God through him. But Peter was more interested in fitting in with the crowd. And maybe me and you are a bit like that. Even when we know the gospel, our hearts are cold to Christ and they're cold to other people who don't know about Christ. We want to stay in our comfort zone. We want to be different, but not different in a good way. See, the love of Christ, says Paul and Peter, the apostle, they say to us, it compels us to go. When we see what Jesus has done for us, that he was lifted up for all men to come to God, then we can't have prejudice. We can't look at different kinds of people and say, well, you can't fit in God's kingdom, or you can't fit in God's kingdom. If I can put it following our analogy, we're not on a pleasure boat here. We're not on a fantasy land little boat which says everything will be okay in the end. No, actually, the Bible says we're on a lifeboat. Together, it's all hands on deck as we try and grab people out of spiritual danger because they're going to a lost eternity. And they'll die unless we get the boat out there. See, what's interesting about this, really, is that Simon and Cornelius, their worlds are are well apart, aren't they? Their worlds are apart as people, as individuals. Humanly speaking, they're disconnected. They're not connecting with each other. Socially, aspirationally, they're opposites. We've got a Roman centurion, a Gentile, non-Jewish professional, Cornelius. And we've got Simon Peter, the Galilean fisherman. We've got an apostle to the Jews and a Roman. (laughs) We've got a church leader and a soldier. It's a bit like a sliding doors film, like two sides of the same coin. As as the spotlights come on, this simultaneous story that happens, we see that they're entirely different people, but they are connected by God's grace. That's the only thing that connects them. A bit like we were hearing earlier, it's the only thing sometimes we've got in common with people from different nationalities, that we all need the saving grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. First, the spotlight's on Cornelius, verses 1 to 8. See, his identity is a centurion. That's his job, to be in control. Sometimes we, we, th- we label people in a little box, don't we? And we say, uh, a bit like Prince Philip, you know, we shake their hands, we say, hello, how are you? And our next question is, what do you do? Well, his tag was he was a centurion. It was his job to be in control. And yet, here we find out that God is taking control of his life. There were three things that we know about him. He's a religious seeker, he's generous, and he's a prayerful man. He's a Gentile, but he's religious, he's generous, and he's prayerful. And he encounters God in this remarkable way. Actually, a very scary, terrifying way that he didn't expect, verse 4. He didn't expect God to tell him to go and find a man called Simon Peter. The story hinges on verse 9, where the scene shifts, the second spotlight, and there you've got Cornelius obediently sending his men to go and find Peter. And the spotlight goes on Peter. And Peter's on the roof praying, encountering God in another supernatural way. God's breaking in as a vision of a blanket from heaven coming down three times, each time telling Peter to see things from heaven's perspective, not his own. See things God's way, Peter. It's bigger than you think. On the blanket crawls a variety of unclean animals, From his Jewish mindset, he thinks, oh, I know what this means. This is all about the Old Testament. Because the Old Testament law said that God has instructed the Jews to remain distinct from other nations, to be different. And the way they were going to do that was to eat certain foods and not eat other unpure, impure, unclean foods. And then we get this cosmic shift. Because as Peter starts to hear this message over and over and over again three times we realize that what God's telling Peter is quite radical. Peter, eat, don't call unclean what I have called clean. In other words, this is a new era, Peter. Because of the Lord Jesus Christ and his light coming into the world, the old law now is superseded by what God is doing in purity terms. There's a different way to be clean now, Peter, and it's the Lord Jesus Christ. And he's still trying to figure out why God's telling him all this in verse 17 when three men are standing at the gate outside of the house. And culturally, they're far apart. 
But geographically, they're really close, aren't they? They couldn't come any further, by the way, because it was obviously a big house, and the gate there uh, meant that they, they couldn't come past the home, homeowner's position without the homeowner's position, permission. They were Gentiles, and they couldn't come any further. They were close, but worlds apart. Exactly at that moment, the Holy Spirit says, Peter, there were three guys downstairs. Very simple, wasn't it? I sent them to look for you. Go and talk to them. So Peter wakes from his slumber, goes down there, verse 21, and says, I'm here. Why are you here? Now, that's an interesting story, isn't it? Why do we hear all those details? Well, partly because the end of the message is wonderful. God goes and tells Cornelius about the Lord Jesus Christ, and him and his whole, whole household get to know about the salvation that is offered in Jesus Christ. And they're baptized, and they take the gospel to the new um, culture. And we're here this evening because we're Gentiles and somebody brought it to us. But actually, the key thing here is that Peter needs to connect with God's heart in order that you'll take the gospel and connect that with somebody else. Ultimately, so that we would connect with the gospel and we'd be here this evening. I've got three little things that I'd like you to take home with you as a summary, really, of, of this. The first one's this. Verses 1 to 8. God prepares people to hear the gospel. Very simple. God prepares people to hear the gospel. See, Cornelius wasn't on Peter's list of people to hear the gospel. Uh, he would be one of the people, like you and me, who would cross off our list. We have a segregation list and think, yeah, he's not going to respond. I won't bother with that. And so he wasn't on the radar of Peter. And yet this guy who would be in control of 200 to maybe 2,000 Roman soldiers was a very influential man, wasn't he? But Cornelius, Cornelius said, well, he's the last kind of guy I would go and preach the gospel to. I, he'd be the last kind of guy you'd invite to a Christmas carol service, wouldn't he? Roman centurion. Um, if we were giving that leaflet to the church barbecue, would you want to go knock on his door? Probably not. I wouldn't either. Because we draw the line with kind of people that we think should be hearing. And that's the view from outside. But God shows us the view from inside. Cornelius, something was happening in his life. The first thing was that he had a hurting heart. Did you notice that when we read it? Something was happening between him and people. He'd become compassionate. He was a generous giver to all those. He saw the mess of the world and he thought, this isn't how it should be. It should be more than this. If you like, if we did sort of comet relief or children in need this evening, he'd be the first one phoning up, texting a gift. He was a softened person, not only towards people, but we see that he was a softened person towards God. And maybe the two things um, had something to do with his job, we don't know. Sometimes we can hide behind our jobs, can't we? Maybe we're a medic or a teacher or... Um, we're in sales or we're in business. And we kind of hide behind the persona of our occupation. What do you do? I, I'm a headmaster. That's not, what, you know, that's not who you are, but that's, that's what you hide behind because that's what you do most of the time. And so you pretend to be a headmaster all the time in control. Then you get home and you're just human like the everybody else. You're the medic who sees the dying person. You go into robot mode, but you get home and you break your heart. And that was maybe him. And compassion had come into his life some way to make him less heartless than an, a Roman soldier would normally be. And that wasn't just towards people, that was also towards God. He was seeking God. He was praying to God. He would be the last sort of person you'd expect to be prayer for, wouldn't he? And maybe you look around your office and you didn't think, oh, none of these guys pray. I, I don't see them saying thanks for their lunch. You don't know what they say to God when they go home. You don't know how they cry out in the middle of the night because life's so awful. What did he pray? Something like this. God, I believe you're there. I've got no idea how I would fit in with your sort because they're entirely different to me. But if you really are there, please tell me. I'm crying out to you, God. Just look at my heart. I really mean this. I need to know. Lord God, I want to engage with you. We don't know what he said, but it was something along those lines, and God accepted it. 
Verse 34 later in the chapter says that God accepted it not for salvation. It doesn't say that he became a Christian because he prayed that prayer. It says that God heard his cry and responded to it. And he sent Peter to tell him about the Lord Jesus Christ. Peter had to go and preach. Otherwise, this, gospel, this guy would never hear. But God had prepared a wonderfully soft heart to receive the Lord Jesus. That's great how God does that, isn't it? When God told you about the Lord Jesus, it worked long before that. He prepared your life and your heart to receive Jesus. To see the mess of a broken world and to see how rubbish it was to live without your Lord and Saviour, your Creator King. Maybe he made you look at the stars one day and you thought there's got to be more to this life than this. See, maybe subconsciously we write off all sorts of people thinking that they have a very limited view, but they probably see more about life than we do. They probably know deep down that there's a God. How do I know that? Well, because the Bible says God's put eternity in our hearts. And we all gravitate towards God. It's like there's a human tom-tom in us. Each one of us searches out God. We might go down all sorts of different avenues looking for God. I'm sure we do. But eventually we realize there's only one way that will get us where we need to be, and that's God himself. What does it look like for your friends? Well, maybe it's a young dad, and he sees the beauty of his firstborn kid. And he's an atheist, and he looks at the beautiful baby, and he starts crying. He doesn't know why he's crying, because, you know, it's just, it's just atoms. It's just something that came from primeval sludge, but I'm crying. It's my little baby. Why am I crying? Is there more to life than this? Maybe it's the grandparents. I've met grandparents who bring up their, their granddaughters, their grandchildren, and they look at the world around them and they say, I've never realized how wicked and evil this world is. Why is it such a mess? Maybe it's the career person. Maybe that's you this evening, a career person. You've dedicated all your life to your career. And then you've been beaten up to prom beaten in promotion by somebody who's a young upstart. Or you've got an illness and you've been laid off on the side and you're not part of the company anymore. Look, the Bible says, whoever you are, there's a Lord of everyone. There's a point where every one of us will stand before the living God. And there's a point in this life, actually, where each of us will discover that we really are a human being, and that's all we are. <laughs> that we need God. John 6, Jesus says, I am the bread of life. He, comes, he who comes to me, hungry and thirsty, I will in no way drive away. And he prepared Cornelius by putting a hunger in his heart and a thirst for Jesus that only Jesus could satisfy. And maybe there are friends in your office and your school and they're really hungry right now. And they're waiting for you to tell them about the Lord Jesus. You ever thought about that? But maybe you've written them off because of their culture, their habits, their speech. And God says, get up. Get up and go and tell them. Get out of your lethargy. Don't be afraid. We're in a broken world. It would be very possible over these next few weeks in multi-site, you know, as we go just two weeks away to... Uh, to take the gospel to another district of Bournemouth and actually entirely miss a whole bunch of people who are crying out for the gospel and the Lord Jesus Christ. Why? Because we don't want to connect with them. We think it's a great thing to move our church over there. People will hear about us. But what if none of us connect with friends who aren't part of this church? What if there's a whole load of people we, we really don't want to get to know? How will they hear about the Lord Jesus? God includes when we exclude. God shows us that people are touchable, lovable human candidates for evangelism, made in the image of God. Uh, 30 years ago, is that right? No, 20, let me try and work it out now. 25 years ago, I was in university, and um, one of the great parts of my university days was a three-day mission for this Christian Union. And uh, we were praying for all sorts of non-Christian friends, and our university preacher for that weekend was a guy who'd been converted as the rugby captain uh, of the university squad. And this was his story, and so for three nights he just told this story, and 30 people came to Christ over three days. Very simple mission. We didn't do anything special. We weren't professional at it. This was his story. 
rugby team captain after winning the cup. He was on the excessive celebratory coach on the way back. He was drunk on the back row. There was a urine stained floor. He'd vomited several times. He'd passed out. And as they drove back home, he said to himself, look, I've won the cup. This is all I ever want to achieve. Uh, but life's really empty. And he was thinking back through life at better times to try and help himself feel better. And he went back to Sunday school and started to sing a few songs. Can you imagine drunken people singing a few Sunday school songs? And that's what he did. And he passed out again. And the next thing he remembered was he was in his uh, a room in Horses of Residence crying out to God, God, if you're there, I really want more in life than this. I feel completely devoid of life this evening. If you are the God of life, I want a new one. And he grabbed hold of his Gideon Bible in, with intention to read it, but his, his eyesight was so blurred from the booze that he couldn't, and he fell asleep again. But he had a sense that God had heard his cry. And in the morning came a knock. And it was his mate from down the corridor who was with the CU, and he said, look, I'm really sorry, Mark, to disturb you. I know you've had a late night. Uh, but I'm doing this survey for the Christian Union, and it's just, well, uh, and it might seem irrelevant to you, but would you mind just answering a few questions about whether God is relevant to you in your life? And Mark said, stuff that, come in, tell me about Jesus. I'm really empty. <laughs> and he became a Christian. Now, why did God use that story so much in our mission? It, it wasn't because Mark was great at telling it, to be honest. It was far more because it was real, and it showed the emptiness of human life. And I reckon that's true for many of our friends. God prepares people to hear the gospel and makes them ready to be filled. There's a second thing. God prepares people, you and me, to speak the gospel. How does he do that? Well, by giving us a bigger view of his sovereign power. That God is in control. And actually, sometimes we can complicate life beyond all rationality. When actually all God wants to do is connect with people and tell them about Jesus Christ. And he's in control of that. See, three times the sheet comes down. And three times Peter says, I can't do it, I can't do it, I can't do what you're asking. And God says, I can. Peter, I'm bigger than you. I'm giving you a wider vision here of what I can do. And it's not etiquette and rules that you have to follow. Being a Christian has never been about that. Being a Christian has always been about following the heart of God and doing what he wants. Do you have a heart to follow me, Peter? Do you love me? I want to see people right with me, Peter. Don't you want that, Peter? And so he looks at the one who came down from heaven, who made himself a sacrifice for our sin. And he looks at Jesus on the cross, and he remembers that Jesus is our purity. Jesus is God's way. Three times the vision comes. Three times it has to come because he hasn't got it. He says it's too complicated. Verse 19, he's perplexed. He's thinking about it, not acting on it. My head's full of all this stuff, God, but I don't understand. Make it simple. And so God does. <laughs> he says, Peter, it's not about your evaluation of other people. It's about your action towards other people. I sent Jesus Christ into the world to save sinners. And that's what it's all about. So don't evaluate people. There's three chaps downstairs who need to hear about the Lord Jesus Christ. Go. Not complicated. If we're honest, that's exactly the conversation we have with God. He prepares us in every way to go and tell people about Jesus because we have a story of his grace in our lives, but we complicate it. We say, why? Well, that's just too complicated. How, how can I tell people what God's done for me? It's too big. Just go, says God. Go and tell them about the Lord Jesus. Go and tell them what he's done for you. And start with the people right close to you. Right on, under your nose, on your doorstep. God's been preparing Peter for a long time for this moment. We read that the reason he went to Joppa was that he wanted to stay amongst the Jews. Hospitality that was offered to him was from a Gentile. And Simon, the tanner, well, he just killed animals and tanned their skins. That was the kind of place that you wouldn't get um, Jewish people. It was a stinky, horrible place on the end of the town, and nobody wanted to go there. But it was the, 
It was the hospitality that God offered Peter. And so he went. And trying to get away from this ugly, stinking job on the roof, he meets with God. And he remembers the one who was an outcast for us, the Lord Jesus, who went to the hill of skulls, out on the edge of the city. And there he shed his blood for us. And he gave us purity in a way that we never deserved, in a way that we could never earn. And Peter sees the four corners come down and he says, Ashley, he's the saviour of the world. The four corners of the earth can be saved because of Jesus. And God has a handle on the whole world. And Peter sees it eventually. And he says, the Lord Jesus has done it. Who am I to not go and tell people about what he's done? Acts 10, 20, get up and go. Don't hesitate, go. For I have sent them. And he goes and tells them that he's welcoming them into a home. That God has a home for anybody regardless of their background. The next day we realise that he's straight away going to tell people that Cornelius' household that God welcomes anyone. He's, he's not favourite. He doesn't show any favouritism in a dying world. Everybody needs to know the Lord Jesus Christ. He gets down off his high horse and he's going right where they are. I wonder if that's a message to you this evening. In the light of what Jesus has done for you, I want to ask you, who are you to not go and tell somebody else about forgiveness of sins and peace with God? Maybe you look at people from different nationalities, people from different cultures, and you think, I don't want to go. I heard somebody the other day at a bus stop talking about, sorry if you're from Eastern Europe here, but they were talking about how they hate the amount of Eastern European people in the country. Saying, I hate Polish people. They're rubbish drivers, Polish people, aren't they? And my heart broke, partly because I know that I'm a worse driver probably than many Poles in our country. And if you're Polish, I apologise to you. Because it's not true. We can be very segregatory when we think about the whole world and all the different diverse cultures that we have in this world. But there's one saviour, says God. And therefore the church dare not, dare not be ethnically segregating. Here's the third thing. God connects those who are ready to hear the gospel with those who are ready to speak the gospel. Are you ready to speak to anybody? Uh, These guys get introduced by the Holy Spirit. That's a wonderful introduction. God's prepared them both to talk about the Lord Jesus. And I guess there are many in our world this evening who are prepared to hear about the Lord Jesus. On one level, what would it take for you to tell somebody this evening? It would take a miracle. It would take God to prepare somebody's life ready to hear the gospel. And it would take a miracle for your heart to be really excited about telling people about Jesus. Is that impossible? No, says the Bible. That's what I do in every heart who comes to know Christ. I soften people so that we speak well of Christ. Luke 18, 27, Jesus replied, what is impossible with man is possible with God. See, the Lord Jesus Christ specializes in the apostle, making all sorts of people who would never connect with the gospel connect with the gospel. He changes situations, history. He specializes in changing people and their destiny. Acts 4.12, Peter had been preaching this. He's saying, there's only one name under heaven by which we must be saved. But in Acts 10, he's forgotten all about it. And he's saying, there's only one place I want to be, on the roof. See, we can be very individualistic and self-centered, can't we? Maybe it's just me. Maybe you're all looking there thinking, no, it's just you, mate. It's easy for you to stand up there. I tell you, it isn't, because I realize that I'm as self-centered as anybody in this room, if not more so. When there are people out there the Lord Jesus sees as sheep without a shepherd, who am I to decide what my life should be? Who am I to decide where my money should go and where my time should be spent? Who am I to decide who my friends should be? Who am I to decide which nationalities I should make friends with? The Lord Jesus Christ wept over Jerusalem. And he's waiting for me to connect with him so that I'm ready to take the gospel. That I would hear his heart. Know that he is boss over my life. 
that he saved me from sin. As I cry to him as Savior and Lord, I have to say, Lord, do with me whatever you want. Send me wherever you desire. Use my mouth and my talents and my gifts and everything I've got for your pleasure. Just make use of what I have to help somebody else come to know Jesus Christ. Maybe you're saying to yourself this evening, my world is too big. My world isn't small at all. It's it's a massive world. It's really complex. I live in Bournemouth where every nation under the sun gathers. It's a really great big world. It might be. But is your heart big? Is your heart ready to say, look at all these nations. What if I told one person and they went back to their country and they told their friends? See, sometimes the answer is for God to show us that the complexity of life is under his control. It's a small world to him. It's not a complex world to God. Our sovereign creator knows what he's doing. He brings people together to hear the gospel so that we coexist in such a way that we can say the love of Jesus Christ to people. We're all in the same boat. It's not that complicated. We're sinners who need saving. Maybe the scale of the task paralyzes you this evening and I want to point you to the Lord Jesus and say, the one who was nailed to the cross, who hung to bring all men to himself, he is now out of the dead city. He rose and he ascended on the basis of his authority, he says, to every disciple, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, because the Trinity God reigns this evening. And if everything's too big for you, it's not too big for him. The whole world is against our Lord Jesus Christ, but none of it could beat him. Satan Hell and death through everything they had at him, but he won. The question this evening isn't, is there a victory to be won? The question is, are you up for it? <laughs> are you ready to go and tell somebody that there's, there's a way for them to be saved? Are you ready to get off your high horse, if I can put it like that, and stop judging people and say like Peter, I need to go downstairs. <laughs> I need to go and tell somebody about the Lord Jesus. Let me just quickly finish with this. A Scottish preacher fi- finished his sermon by preaching on this passage, and he said, Alexander White, he was from the Free Church of Scotland in Glasgow, he he was preaching this, he said, it would change your whole heart tonight if you would take Peter and Cornelius home with you and lay them to your heart. Why not get a four-cornered paper napkin or serviette with, with you and write on it all the names of nations, churches, individuals, public men, private citizens, and fellow members of your church, all the people you dislike and despise, and you will never love them. And keeping their names on your soiled napkin, look up to God and say, not so, Lord Jesus. I will never speak well of them. I will never think well or hope well of these people. I cannot do it, and I will not try. If you did that, says Alexander White in 1920, you acted out and spoke all the evil things that are in your heart, the prejudices of your heart. You'd be so horrified that you get a sight of it yourself and you'd never forget it. Why not do it this evening when you go home? Get a piece of A4 and say, Lord, these are all the people I've really struggled with. And they know you. And these are all the people who don't yet know you. Do a miracle in my heart, please. Let's pray together. Gracious Father, we thank you that we can call you Father this evening. An amazing miracle that you've done in our hearts to love you and to receive you. We pray with full hearts of thankfulness this evening that you would change us to be much better ambassadors of the Lord Jesus Christ. Messengers of reconciliation. That in these next few days and weeks as we move church to a different site, Lord, we pray that you would set us apart as your people as a people ready to go with the gospel, to connect with those who are prepared, ready to listen to you. So that in our neighborhoods and the people we live with and work with, we would be a taste of life. That we would see your changing power at work in us so that we might invite people to see the welcome of heaven. 
Lord, please, we ask for the whole congregation here that each one of us would have an open heart this evening to what you're saying. Now, we, as we go, we go in grace and love, knowing that you've forgiven us all of all our sin as we come to you. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.